So I'm now going to hand over to Nick Donoghue, who is uh, formerly the Global Head of Research at J.P. Morgan Chase, um, who uh, produced a uh, very significant uh, piece of work on impact investing. Nick is currently the, uh, an advisor with uh, Ronald Cohen to the government and um, uh, establishing what, is, what you'll hear a little bit about later on, the Big Society Bank with 600 million of funding to tackle some of the challenges here at home. But please uh, give a warm hand and uh, welcome Nick Donoghue. Nick. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, one of the great things about working at JP Morgan, a firm like JP Morgan, is you get lots of people who run around and do your PowerPoint presentations for you. And then once you leave JP Morgan, you realize that, especially if you end up working with the government, you realize that you don't have those people doing your PowerPoint presentations for you. And furthermore, because you were so spoilt during your time at JP Morgan, you don't know how to do them yourself. So that's my sort of excuse for showing you a presentation that we developed in, uh, at the end of last year. Um, hopefully it will, as we say in the research world, this is a piece of research that has a significant shelf life, so hopefully it won't uh, appear in any way out of date. I'm not going to go through all, this, all the uh, individual slides because this was developed to go into this research report in more detail than I plan to do today, but it is available, the slide deck is available to everybody. And the research report, Impact Investing, an emerging asset class, is also available without uh, any passwords or anything else on the JP Morgan on the J.P. Morgan website if you wish to uh, look at it more closely. Um, so the genesis of what we did, uh, the report that we published at the end of last year, was uh, discussions that we at J.P. Morgan had with um, principally the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, who as many of you in the room will know have been an important catalyst for the development of impact investing broadly in the U.S. And, and around the world. Um, and I think in our discussions we realized there was a lot of unknowns, there's probably more unknowns in this field than there was knowns. And specifically, even at the very elementary level, there was no proper definition of what impact investing really meant. Um, there was almost no data. We, we knew investments had been made and people were making investments, um, but there was very little data on those investments available. Um, and of course, we were dealing with a market of huge scope. We were dealing with principally focused on the base of the pyramid and uh, which by, uh, by some measures is as many as four billion people around the world. Um, so we wanted to try and get some sense of what the size of the market might be. So if I, um, specifically I guess um, when, we, when we broke it down there were six major questions we, want to, we wanted to look at. The first one as I said is a definition. What does it really mean to say that you're an impact investor and how does that differ from a normal risk uh, investor who seeks to just to maximize his risk adjusted return. Who's involved, meaning who is actually institutionally and individually today, who is actually making, uh, uh, making these type of investments. Um, what makes impact investing an, a an emerging asset class? And that, although um, uh, is, is not a trivial question, but, it's, but it is an important question because whether or not uh, assets are defined within their own asset class uh, makes a significant difference in terms of how institutions seek to manage those assets and also the amount of money they're likely to in invest in them. Um, so we wanted to look at that question. Um, we wanted to look at the question of financial return because one of the things you often hear about impact investing is that, um, or one of the questions you often hear is, does it, if you want to create this positive impact, does it require you to sacrifice some of your return? Um, as I said, data in this area has been very limited. So we wanted to do what we could to collect some data and look at it and benchmark it and so on. And uh, for that purpose, we used uh, um, an organization called the Global Impact Investing Network, which is an organization that was originally founded uh, by the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and we went out to their members, their investor council members, to uh, uh, those, those members were willing to provide data to the Rockefeller Foundation, which they would not, or to the Global Impact Investing Network, which they would not have been ma make available to a firm like JP Morgan. And then that was presented to us on an anonymous and aggregated basis. So at least we were able to draw some conclusions, uh, some very high level conclusions, which I'll show you. Um, we want to look at the size of this market. And again, that's a, an enormous task if you define the market as serving the, all, all, the, all the basic needs 
of the base of the pyramid, which, as I said, can be defined as as many as 4 billion people around the world. So I think rather than define the whole size of the market, what we ended up trying to do was try to think of or define a framework whereby you could think about how sort of sector by sector, how, how big was the potential market in health or education or housing or whatever. Um, and finally, we wanted to look at some of the risk management issues and also the social impact measurement issues, which are obviously a critical and quite unique part of this, this type of investing. So those were the questions. And again, I'm going to, and apologies uh, uh, some of the, for those of you who can't read all the print in this. Um, we uh, started with a definition, and our definition of impact investing was investments that are intended to create positive social impact beyond financial return. And what's important about that definition is, first of all, they're investments. So they're not grants or donations, but they're investments where you're, where, where you're buying effectively some form of asset and you expect to get some return on your capital. And you do that with the intent of creating some predefined and measurable ho or, uh, uh, um, social impact. And a lot of people ask the question, what's the difference between what is socially responsible investing, which is obviously a very feel, big field of investing today, and impact investing? And I think to a large extent, the social responsive investor starts out with a business and he tries to build around that a, a, a set of uh, um, environmental and social and governance criteria to make that business work better in, the, in terms of how it serves society. I think the impact investor starts from the other direction. He starts at lo by looking for need and then trying to build a viable financial model around uh, that, that can serve, um, uh, serve that need. So he starts with the intent of creating um, a social impact rather than the intent of creating a financial return. Um, there's two dimensions to, to impact investing. Um, unlike traditional investing or where you simply look at individual, you, tend, you typically break it down sector by sector, uh, impact investors tend to do that too. They look at their individual sectors, agriculture, water, housing, education, health, which obviously lend themselves to this type of investing. But there's a second dimension to impact investing as well, which, which looks at um, how the businesses um, deliver the impact. So, um, and those impacts are typically de delivered either through the process of the business. So in other words, they create the, the business process itself creates jobs or more efficient energy or utilizes a, a base of the pyramid, a broader base of the pyramid supply chain or they collect or, or they produce products that are directed at, at the base of the pyramid, so clean water, better housing, um, education, better health, and so on. Um, there are one of the things that we um, found at JP Morgan, my involvement, as uh, Stuart said, I was a global head of research and had been, have been for, was for about eight or nine years. But I, the last three years at JP Morgan, I got the opportunity to run a group called Social Finance. And social finance was a group that our chief executive set up uh, um, to try to explore this area, made some capital available from the firm to invest in, 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 in uh, double bottom line impact in investment. So we invested, for example, in microfinance fund, we invested in microinsurance, we invested in a bottom of the pyramid fund in, um, in, in Latin America. We invested here in the UK in something called Bridges Social Entrepreneurs Fund, which is a social entrepreneurs fund. Um, and what we found as, as we did this and as we obviously talked to other investors around the world is that there is a very significant movement um, in, in the institutional investor community towards taking at least some part of your portfolio and thinking about it in the context of what is the, what is the, the social impact of this portfolio over and above uh, you know, the, the money or the return we might earn from it. And I think we were surprised initially by how many people were willing to embrace that idea and we were um, uh, particularly gratified over the period of uh, certainly the three years I was involved by how, m how many more people, it was a base of people to start with, but how many more people came to the table. And this slide just lists some of the people. Um, obviously the development finance institutions like the IFC and the EBRD have been doing this type of investment, investment um, or a version of this type of investment for many, many years. Um, an increasing number of private foundations, so Gates and Omajar and Rockefeller and so on, have, uh, have, have over the last three to five years joined in. Financial institutions, JP Morgan, Citibank, uh, Deutsche Bank, a number of big pension fund managers in the US and, uh, and, and in the Netherlands, 
and then increasingly some corporates and particularly high net worth individuals uh, and, um, and, and family offices where the issue of fiduciary responsibility and the need to maximize or the requirement, the legal requirement to maximize your, 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 your uh, risk adjusted return is not quite so obvious. Um, but it is certainly, or certainly it felt to us like it was part of, of sort of the post, what I would describe as the post-credit crisis zeitgeist, that there was a disillusionment with banks and disillusionment with uh, traditional f uh, finance and traditional investments, and there was a real desire among the investment community across the whole spectrum of the investment community, from your retail sort of ISA-based investors right across to your wealthiest individuals and largest institutions, to try to find and embrace and develop something that was a little different and took a broader view of, of, um, of, of returns rather than just, as I say, maximizing a financial return. Um, now, on the question of, 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 uh, of the asset class, and this, is a, this may seem, to some of you in the room who have not been involved day to day in the investing business, may seem a rather arcane sort of question. But in fact, within the investment community, it's a very important one, because to a large extent, um, it, defines, um, how, it defines in the long term how much money will be made available to a particular uh, style of investing. Um, and um, since about, you know, prior to 19, I would say 1990s, um, investing, an asset class was typically defined by very strict criteria developed by, by um, people, uh, institutions, chartered financial analysts in, uh, in the United States. Assets had to be, the asset class had to be homogenous assets, mutually exclusive, diversifying, and, to, and really there were only four, three or four different form uh, asset classes. Equity, when I started in the investment business, equities, bonds, cash, real estate, maybe commodities. But what we've seen over the last 10 years or 20 years has been a real proliferation in what in the types of investing or the forms of investing that are described as asset classes. And to a large extent, we've moved away from defining an asset class by the underlying financial characteristics of the assets and towards defining an asset class by how investment institutions and the investment industry organizes around it. And on that basis, so when, when you think about, and the best examples of asset classes that have developed that were hedge funds um, were, um, or private equity, which are not, uh, which are basically involved, their, their underlying their financial characteristics under our assets are pretty traditional, but in fact, because they're set, they're organized, managed, risk managed uh, in a different way, they've come to be defined as their own asset classes. And impact investing is very much the same. The underlying assets are equities and bonds. Uh, but there is a unique set of, of investment and risk management skills that need to be brought to bear when you're making these investments. And most of those skills relate to the social impact of the, or measuring the social impact of the investment you're, you're, you're making. And in order to make those type of investments, institutions set up, uh, organizational structures, the industry sets up industry or organizations and associations and uh, um, educate forms uh, of training and education and around this form of investing develops a whole uh, s suite of standardized metrics and benchmarks and ratings and the point that we were making in our report is that is what is happening in impact investing um, that it, and so for that reason um, it's important that we think of it as an emerging asset class rather than try to look at what we could do in the end, specifically in our equity investment in our, in our, or in our bond investment. And it's, a, it's an important question because, you know, if, if, if the investment community believes something is an asset class, they will create a bucket for it, they will get people to look at it, and if they create a bucket for it, they'll want to put something in that bucket. And so um, defining something as, as an asset class has significant implications for how quickly the asset, the, the uh, amount of assets can, can, uh, can grow. Um, so um, let me move on to um, financial return. I'm not going to go through all these slides. Um, calculating financial return for impact investments is a very difficult thing to do. It's partly difficult through very little data because there haven't been an enormous number of transactions. Most of those transactions are not public, they're private. Even if you had data, it's very difficult to find relevant um, uh, benchmarks against which to benchmark your performance. It's difficult to decide what time frames you should look at when you're looking at that performance. 
Um, it's difficult uh, when most of the investments, most of the data that we were able to collect was forward-looking rather than backward-looking. So you're asking people for their expected return rather than their actual return. And as we know, people expected return tends to trail. In our business, expected return tends to trail actual returns. So you have a, uh, you have a uh, sort of an optimistic bias going in. Um, and then there are different types of impact investments. Some people take a very strong financial first view on investments. Some people uh, make it, uh, and, and want to make, ensure first and foremost that they earn a decent return and then create the impact. Some people do it the other way around. So it's very difficult to try and really look at it, look at uh, um, with, with such a small number. And we managed to get data through the Global Impact Investing Network in about 1,100 transactions. It's very difficult to sort of ha to get enough critical mass of data from that sort of um, um, uh, set of results to try and really make any strong, draw any strong conclusions, and particularly, when, as I said, because of all the other issues I mentioned. Um, but we did um, come to some very broad conclusions, and I, and I think the broadest conclusion was when we looked at the data, we split it, the, we split it into developed markets, emerging markets, equity, and debt. And what seemed, to be hap what seemed to be the case was that if you're in emerging markets, investing in emerging markets, there is a belief that you can earn a, something close to a commercial return, whether you look at a debt product or an equity product. Um, if you're in developed markets, UK and the US, there seemed to be a, um, a belief that your expected return was likely to lag what would have been traditional returns from that asset class. And I think that's driven by the fact that when you are in investing in emerging markets, you are investing in the base of the pyramid, an enormous con potential consumer market. And if you can bring new and innovative business models, successful business models to that market, uh, then potentially you can earn um, uh, uh, very um, significant returns. Um, so again, I'll skip through those. Uh, again, anybody who's interested, uh, there's more detail on the, in the slide deck. Um, but let me turn to the question of um, the size of the market, because the original intention of Rockefeller when we set out to do this was to try, what they really want to know is how big is this market? How much capital do we need to solve all these problems? And of course, the more you get into it, the more you realize that the problems are so enormous and the number of people is so enormous and the diversity of these issues in different countries around the world is so huge that it's impossible really to try to bring to, to find one answer to, uh, to that question. Um, and um, what we did think about, though, was what's the right framework to, 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 uh, to, uh, to, when you look at a particular area like health or education, housing, is there a framework that we could use to try and at least get to some, somewhere closer to that answer? Um, and we also asked ourselves why the opportunity existed. And the, uh, the opportunity, of course, exists because in, in um, uh, uh, traditional business models don't work terribly well in many of the countries in which you, um, on which impact investors seek to do business. Finance is very difficult, to access, particularly for small and medium-sized enterprises to access. Um, the logistics and infrastructure that support the business community are poor, so you think about roads and ports and communication, power and refrigeration. So a lot of these things don't exist or exist in, or, or in very, uh, very, uh, um, or poor, um, and then many of the businesses uh, that people rely on in these countries have very variable and unpredictable cash flows because of seasonal climatic factors and so on. And for that reason, many traditional businesses don't target the base of the pyramid, and they don't target perhaps for good reasons because their traditional business models don't work in it. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. Mobile phones, for example, I remember in the mid-1990s, as analysts, when we discussed the growth of the mobile phone industry, the idea that you would, in 10 or 15 years, go to every country in Africa and find everybody holding a mobile phone was unthinkable. Yet that is, that is, um, that is what, what has happened. Um, and also, we know that the government and the ability of government and, and aid to solve these problems is also uh, very limited. There just simply isn't enough aid to address the, 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 the number of problems that we have. So the, the, the need for impact investing is driven by the need to bring new and innovative business models, sustainable and scalable models, to some of these issues. And I always, you know, microfinance has been a flagship for impact investing. And when you think about microfinance, um, it started because somebody, Mohammed Yunus, bought a new and innovative business model 
um, to poor people in Bangladesh. He, and the new innovative business model was he lent for, to women, principally, and he organized those women in groups. And so effectively, they cross-collateralized each other. Um, and so from that small beginning in the 1970s grew a business today that, uh, that uh, provides financial access to over uh, to close to 100 million people. And that it's not without its problems, and we've seen some of those problems have been illustrated very clearly in the last couple of years in, in places like India. But it, nevertheless, there are 100 million people today who have financial access that wouldn't have if we hadn't started with that uh, new and in innovative business model. Um, and what we learned from that process is what, you know, there, there's an evolution in these businesses and as they become increasingly commercialized, particularly if the commercial returns become too attractive, that can lead to a significant mission drift. So it's important to understand as, you, as these businesses grow, how you control not only the financial, grow, the financial issues that surround growth, but also the, the, the mission, the potential mission drift that it creates. Um, so, but we did do, nevertheless, some work on trying to, uh, the basic model we used was we tried to find innovative business models that were working in some part of the world. And we said, okay, if you take that around the world and assume it'll work every, equally everywhere, then how big a business could that be? What sort of revenues might it generate? What sort of capital might be required? And again, all that detail is in, is in the report. And I wouldn't put a huge amount of faith in the overall numbers, although I have to say they've been widely quoted. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, 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 but I would simply say that by any standards, in any way you look at this, uh, this is a very significant potential market with up to a trillion dollars. Um, just the, the small parts that we looked at, uh, which is by no means all inclusive, um, uh, up to a trillion dollars of potential uh, profit opportunity. Um, so that was, the, that was the, um, the, the size of the market. The last question we looked at was this issue of risk management and uh, social impact measurement. And that's a very difficult, uh, uh, particularly the social impact part is a very difficult part. Risk management, risk managing these investments is not dissimilar to risk managing traditional investments with the one additional issue that there is a, uh, that effectively many of these businesses make money from the poor. And that can be reputationally, we've seen some of this in microfinance, that reputationally that's something you have, you have to be careful about. But the underlying financial characteristics and risk are very similar. Um, the other, the, the, the element of social impact measurement and risk is a very difficult one and we spend a little time in our uh, uh, report addressing that but it's by no means meant, intended to provide uh, any sort of answers. Impact measurement is a sort of a silver bullet that can unleash vastly, vastly more capital to this uh, uh, industry. People, mainstream investors are going to be much more comfortable becoming impact investors if the impact investment community can tell them what impact they're creating and how much impact they're creating. And if that was a simple question, we would have answered it already. It's not simple and to a large extent impact is in people are looking for different things, they're looking for different types of impact. Um, so to some extent it's in the, it's in, it's in the eye of the beholder. Um, and, um, and what we cannot do is impose upon what are often very small companies or enterprises a, an enormous need to prove impact and an, an enormously bureaucratic process which takes a lot of time and costs a lot of money. Um, so it is, uh, so it, is a very, it, is a, it is a very difficult area. Um, but certainly when you're making these type of investments in the same way that you make a financial investment and you risk, you risk not earning your projected financial return, in an impact investment you make the investment, you risk not uh, uh, producing the sort of impact that you intend to, uh, intend to produce. Um, so that's, um, that's sort of a very quick overview of our report. As I said, it's available on our website, or the J I shouldn't say our anymore, their website, JP Morgan's website. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, so if, you, uh, if you wanted to spend more time with it, this, this deck is available on the conference website. Um, the key conclusions, as I said, were one, we do think this should be positioned as an asset class. We think that's the right thing to do given how how the investment community now defines an asset class and we think it can make a material difference in terms of how quickly assets will be attracted to this type of investment. We think the market is huge um, uh, and certainly, um, again, I wouldn't put a huge amount of, we don't want to be overly precise, but certainly to use numbers like a trillion dollars is not, is not unrealistic. 
um, the benchmark and understanding what returns you're making, whether or not you're sacrificing returns to create this impact, is a very, is a very difficult thing, particularly when you're dealing with expected returns. Um, but there clearly is a, a, a wide spectrum. There are a group of investors who genuinely believe they can, I like to think, have their cake and eat it, meaning they can both invest, earn this return, and, 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 and not make a trade-off. Personally, I'm a little skeptical that, that that's really the case, but that's certainly, there's certainly uh, investors who believe that. Um, and, uh, and finally, that we have an in, a need for an investment infrastructure, particularly around some of these measurement issues, and sort of having a common language to define how we, uh, what, what impacts we're seeking to create, and a lot more work uh, needs, to be, needs to be done on that. So those are the key conclusions of the report. Before I take questions, I would just like to spend two minutes, because I know there are some people in the room, perhaps not all of you, but some people in the room who are interested in the big society bank, because as Stuart said in his, in his uh, introduction, I'm working with a gentleman called Sir Ronald Cohen, who many of you will know um, or, or know by reputation, who was a successful venture capitalist and has been involved in the social investment, the growth of social investment in the UK for the last 10 years. Uh, but together, we have been asked by the government to help with the uh, establishment of what is called, the, of what is, I always say, what is, what is colloquially called uh, the Big Society Bank. And what the Big Society Bank is, it's actually not an idea from this government. It was an idea that was ori originated from the previous Labour government as a social investment bank. And its mission is to catalyze social investment here in this country. So it starts with the belief that there is a pool of investors that um, is looking for this something that exists between philanthropy and maximizing your, your risk-adjusted return. Um, and this is a market that, that, that there's, a lot of, there's a large number of potential investors who would like to do this, um, be social investors or impact investors, but they need more product, they need a better market infrastructure, and more support, and so on. Um, and so the, the, uh, the Big Society Bank's mission is to help to develop that market, be a market champion for that market, and obviously also invest in that market. It's capitalized by two sources of capital. One is the unclaimed or dormant bank accounts that's, uh, that sit in all our, all our banks here in the UK. And the government passed legislation in 2008 to sweep that money into uh, uh, what, uh, via the uh, uh, rather circuitous route, uh, but event, um, and through the big lottery fund into the big society bank. We believe that's in the region, or we're told that's in the region, about 400 million pounds. And the other source of capital is, as part of Project Merlin, which is the agreement that the banks made, the much criticized agreement that the banks made with the government, whereby the government would perhaps not complain as much about excessive bonuses and not levy additional taxes. On the other hand, the banks, the, U, the major, four major UK banks, would do some good things for the country. And one of the four or five things that they pledged to do was to invest 200 million pounds of capital in the big society bank. So, those two sources together make up 600 million pounds, which will be capitalizing this institution. We have um, the, the, the position we're in today is that uh, Sir Ronald and I put forward an outline proposal to the government, which was published last week, and is available on the Cabinet Office website. Uh, that was endorsed last week by the government, so we are now moving to the implement, implementation phase, which means we have a couple of significant regulatory hurdles to, to, to jump over. One is FSA approval, and the other one is uh, we need an exemption from what's called EU state aid rules, because this is a transfer of public money to what would be a private company. Um, but at the end of this, uh, and those, pro those processes will probably take six months or so, uh, uh, but at the end of this process, we will have here in the UK a, an institution which will be unlike anything else in the world. No other government has, 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 has you know, found funds to, to create this type of institution. So the Big Society Bank will be, um, let me say, the institution colloquially known as the Big Society Bank will be uh, quite unique in the world and I think has the opportunity to uh, provide um, a, a real boost to, to social investment, particularly here in this country. Now, it's important, and it will be an independent and transparent and, and self-sufficient organization. It's important to people in this room, obviously, if you're involved in UK, in impact of social investment here in the UK, it's important. 
because although it's a wholesaler, it, provides, it, will, it's, it will not provide funds to frontline organizations, it will not provide grants, but it will support intermediaries, financial intermediaries that will provide funds to, to, to third sector organizations. But I think it's also important for those of you who are not involved in the UK at all, but are focused on emerging markets, because the mission of the Big Society Bank is to create impact of social investing as an asset class. So a lot of the structures that, that, develop, that, that are developed, the type of funds that are, are developed, um, can I think be equally used for both addressing social investment in the, US, in the UK, but also addressing, some, uh, addressing social or impact investing outside the UK. Um, so although the Big Society Bank will not make money directly available um, to, uh, to it for investment in, or support investment outside the UK, I think it can be an important uh, step forward for everybody who's interested in, in, in this uh, particular area. So that's, uh, that's all I wanted to say. I thank you for your attention, and I guess we have a couple of minutes for questions. Thank you. So are there any questions? I think one over here. I think we have a couple of microphones. Hello. Oh. It certainly has. I'm Malcolm Durham. I'm an accountant, so I'd love to dwell on the figures a little bit. Um, and I'm sitting here puzzling over the, the size of the market being a trillion and making 66.7% profit on it, mm. which sounds too good to be true. Could you expand on the assumptions of what actually those headline figures really mean? Yeah, I don't want to go through all the assumptions. That, that profit number is a 10-year number. Okay? So, uh, um, so that's where you get to... Uh, uh, I mean, I can go through, if you like, in more detail the model with you afterwards, but it's, it, we're looking at projected profits over, over a 10-year uh, um, period. Okay. Um, what's the annual rate of return? And it depends. And what we looked at was there are six, or, and if, again, if you look at the report, there are six or seven different industries. So we looked at housing, we looked at an example in health, we looked at an example in education, we looked at some of the data from microfinance, and the rate of return varies quite significantly in those, in those uh, it can vary anywhere from sort of 5 or 6% up to 20%. So, but I would encourage you um, to look at, uh, you're one of the very few people actually who's asked questions about the, model, the financial model, and there are lots of good questions you could ask. So I, and uh, because it is, it does rely on, I mean it's a very, you know, it, we made a lot of very significant assumptions in there to get to this number, and that's why I caveat when I, you know, we put, it, what, what tends to happen is you have to come up with a number somehow, and then that number gets picked up and, 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 and as you say, it relies on a whole lot of assumptions. The biggest assumption is that you can take a health, for example, a model that works to support health or housing in India and apply it all around, around the world. So there, there's a lot of, um, but it's, it's, there is a lot more detail in the report. Yeah, in the middle. Sorry. Any um, unforeseen social consequences, especially negative? In, um, you mean in broadly in, in the... In that you've done? Well, I think the, the best example of unforeseen social consequences comes from the microfinance industry. Um, and um, what the microfinance industry has illustrated, particularly over the last two or three years, is that if you find a model that works, that can generate significant returns on capital. More traditional, purely profit-motivated uh, investors will find that and seek to exploit it. And they will seek to exploit it by corrupting the mission. And in microfinance, and I always say to people when we talk about microfinance, any of us can stand out in the street corner anywhere in the world and hand out money. That is not a difficult thing to do. The difficult thing to do is handing it out in a prudent way to the right people so it makes a difference to their lives and then, and then uh, um, hopefully uh, getting it back. And so, um, and that's not what happened, for example, in India, where microfinance, the, the rapid growth of the microfinance industry and the very large amounts of capital. We also know, we've seen in more traditional markets, that in, 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 um, in, in credit businesses, large flows of capital can obscure underlying credit problems, often for many, many years, which again is what happened in, 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 in Indian microfinance. So you ended up with a lot of people who had multiple borrowings from many institutions who were over-indebted and who would have frankly been better off if they'd never heard of microfinance. 
So there are, so that's an example of unintended consequences and that it is important to make sure that if you are um, running an impact investing business or supporting impact investing business that you have clear controls in place to make sure the mission, that the, in the enterprise stays true to the mission. Yeah, right? Nick. Daniel, Daniel Brewer from Resonance. Um, I just want to ask a question about risk, um, both uh, in terms of the lower return that mm. is perceived in the developed nations. Yeah. One of the things um, that we found in taking a number of uh, social investment opportunities to uh, the marketplace is that we, we think that the products that we're putting to these institutional investors and, and high net worths um, actually, they're not the highest returns comparable to the asset classes that they could invest in, um, but they are risk adjusted. There are uh, uh, there we have, there are lower risk elements to it. Uh, I just wonder whether you think yeah. there is uh, a, that, that there's any substance to that. And the other is about reputational risk. Um, and particularly if uh, we're going to get access to a trillion dollars, then I imagine we're hoping to unlock some institutions, um, pension companies yeah. and others who got, got the willing to look at some of this and some, some people we've been talking to around that. Um, but what I'm nervous about, and, uh, uh, and I was talking to a colleague, uh, Gavin, last night about it, was uh, um, you know, are they prepared to make an impact investment? And if it goes wrong, how does that look? Um, mm. when they say, I want my money back, and yeah. how nasty can I be to make yeah. that work? Look, I th well, I mean, the two questions there. One is the question of risk. I think to, um, to a large extent, the risk in this type of investing means uh, comes from the fact that most of what's being proposed, most of the investments that are proposed are small. They have very little in the way of track records. So they're often startups. Um, they have no precedent. Often, you know, they, they're again exploring new and more innovative business models. If they're focused on emerging markets, they're often in, 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 in not just in sort of mainstream emerging market, but often in some of the most emerging market, most sort of frontier mar uh, markets in the world. Um, so, for all those reasons, they do appear to carry. I mean, risk to some extent, risk is a function of how much data you have, you know. And if, as we build up data on these type of investments. Then, 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 you know, financial institutions, if they don't have the data, assume the worst. So, so, um, so I think scale, both of the enterprises and of the funds investing them, is a big, is a big part of the problem. The question of reputation, I think, is very important. I mean, it's something we talk, we talked about it at J.P. Morgan. I mean, it's it's some of the institutions that are investing are investing because they are they feel like there are, there are reputational benefits to be uh, to be obtained from this type of investing, and I think there are. I think uh, Oregon, and particularly financial institutions, being seen to uh, not just chase the last dollar for their bottom line, I think is is um, is a good thing to be seen to be doing that is is a good thing for the brand, but it can backfire on you also. And so you have to be uh, because at the end of the day, as I said in the presentation, you're making money from the poor in most of these investments, and that can be that can present uh, and there's no real in every investment category. Car car has elements of risk, and this one is no exception. But that is something that's more specific to this, perhaps, than others. Nick, I've got the other microphone. Can yeah. I ask just yeah. Nick, thank you. Thank you very much for the overview, um, Richard Goff. Um, I want to, it's been very helpful to, to, to look at the potential, but I wonder if you could look into your crystal ball and share your thoughts as to where you think impact investment yeah. is going to go, possibly, say, over the next five years. Yeah. Look, I think, in, and this is why I say, even for those of you who are involved in emerging markets, the big, something like the Big Society Bank is important. Because I think that our vision is that five years from now, that people, if you go take a, 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 you know, a random sample of investors at a dinner party or whatever, and you ask, and you, you ask them the question, you know, if there was something that I could, an investment I could offer you that wasn't philanthropy, but actually wasn't going to generate the maximum return, um, or it was particularly risky, but you knew that even if it went wrong, you were generating substantial uh, social impact in Africa or whatever. Would you take at least part of your portfolio and put it into that investment, 5 or 10%? Or and the vast majority of people, in fact, there's been data under the Nesta 
uh, uh, with the Ipsos Mori did a survey recently in the UK which found a significant majority of people, if given that op opportunity, would take that opportunity. And so I think what we see, in, or what our vision is in five years, that they will know how to do that. That they won't sit there and say, yeah, I'd like to do that, but I don't know how to do it. That there will be clearly identifiable product available from mainstream financial institutions as well as specialist financial institutions. And that's, so that's one hand. And on the other hand, that social entrepreneurs or social enterprises, whether they be involved in, in Africa or in, in sort of Leeds or Manchester, that they will find it much easier to, to, to uh, identify and, and find that sort of, uh, um, you know, receive investment from that sort of capital. So that's sort of the, the, the uh, that's, I guess, our, our long-term vision. And it's an ambitious one. But I think it's, uh, we see an enormous amount of momentum in that direction, which is very encouraging. Thanks, Stuart. Can we just have one, uh, we, this is our last question. I'm delighted that the, yeah. uh, the address has stimulated so much uh, questioning. If you, this will be the last question. If you'd like to catch Nick at coffee, yeah. I'm sure um, he'd be delighted to uh, field more questions. Hi, Nick. Yeah. Um, Hi. Idiane Montagia from KPMG. Um, thank you very much. Very mm. interesting mm. presentation. I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the social impact metrics aspect yeah. of it. What yeah. have you seen through the, yeah. the study that has been particularly promising? Um, I work in the area, I fully understand your yeah. assertion that it is very challenging to find yeah. metrics that can be used, um, yeah. if you like, mm. across all investments. Yeah. But are there any particularly yeah. um, promising initiatives mm. that you've seen and are any mm. particularly bad metrics that have been used? Come well, you know, the silver bullet for impact measurement is that we can all coalesce, or certainly the mainstream investor community can coalesce around one or two measurements of, of impact, in the same way that um, uh, the credit investors coalesce around Standard & Poor's and Moody's, for better or worse, they do, uh, in terms of, of measuring uh, underlying credit quality. Um, but it's a very difficult process, as you, I'm sure, know if you look at it. I think there is, there has, I'm encouraged by the fact that there's quite a lot of investment and research going into it. I think the work that's been done, led by the Global Impact Investing Network, on building what the system called IRIS, because what you need for a measurement system is, first of all, a common language and taxonomy to support that. You know, what con if somebody says they're creating a job, what is a job? Is it a full time job or a part time job? Or so these type of very basic sort of language issues. ISIS seeks to do that, and I think that's received quite a bit of support. Um, and then, um, but there's, and there's various initiatives, both in the US and the UK, to try and build on that, to um, move to the sort of perfect world of a established and commonly recognized rating a system um, that mainstream investors can understand. Um, but I don't think we are there yet. One, again, one of the roles of the social investment bank here in the UK is actually to try to encourage people to coalesce around some sort of um, uh, impact measurement system. So I'm, see, I'm, in, you know, I'm encouraged, there's, there's money being spent on research being done, we're making progress, but it's slow and it's, and it's difficult. Thank you. Thank you.